So my name is Michael Hausenblas. I'm a developer advocate at Mesosphere. And uh, yeah, when I, I got that uh, invitation <coughs> and uh, the opportunity to speak today about uh, container orchestration, I thought, let's do something different. Like, like usually I have this story from A to Z. And this one is really a bunch of questions that I constantly get. And it's kind of like, here's the question, and here's the answer. And because I'm a, a really lazy person, I only have so many questions prepared, and I'm counting on you that for the last, like, last 20, 30 minutes, you help me out a bit. You come with your own questions, and hopefully I have the answers then, right? So this is my first and last slide. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Just kidding. Um, quick show of hands, who of you is familiar on some level with containers, Docker? Wow. Cool. VMs? Don't be shy. Okay. You shall be forgiven. So, containers are like virtual machines, right? Who agrees? You sure? So, <clears throat> I would argue no. And this stack, or do not stack, <laughs> whoever did that, great job. Um, I would argue no. They're not like VMs. They are totally not like VMs because they are really very lightweight come and go um, packages <coughs> for application level dependency management. So rather than providing a full isolated environment with a full stack, come on in, come on in, there are still plenty of places there, like at least 15 I see here on that right side, or left side from where you are. Um, so it's really, don't, don't uh, approach containers with your virtual machine experience and with your virtual machine hat on, no matter if it's red or not, um, really try to think of it like, who of you does Python? Right, so you know virtual env, right? That's a great thing. And it's kind of like virtual env for any other language who does not have this uh, wonderful environment. Uh, as I said, very lightweight. Um, the average runtime, and I've linked it from here, I'm gonna upload that uh, deck after the talk onto a speaker deck and share it. Um, I think New Relic found that it's in a couple of minutes. So containers literally come and go uh, much faster than I can deliver this talk to you. And last but not least, it is pets versus cattle. Who of you has heard about pets versus cattle? Of course you have. So these are the well-known pets, and really it doesn't make a difference if you're talking about hardware or a virtual machine, you really do care about your little babies there. And if they get sick, you, you're trying to nurse them back into health, and they're, they're gorgeous, and they're nice, and they have names and, and whatnot, but we're really talking about cattle, right? Um, no matter if you're vegetarian or not, um, someone, <laughs> I saw someone giving a talk, I uh, said, you know, I'm, I'm a vegetarian, so it's, it was something else, like not pets versus cattle, but I, I can't remember what, but someone said, like, that's not correct. It's like totally missing the point. The point being, you don't give a shit about the single <laughs> instance. If it's pets, cattle, or I don't know what, it is the fact that you do not give <clears throat> whatever about the single instance. So if one of these containers dies, so what, you're gonna launch another one very fast uh, and hopefully automatically. Are containers secure? So when I, we've got three kids and what they learned already in kindergarten, uh, you know, with knives and, and, and pairs of scissors or whatever, you know, there's a particular way how you're supposed to handle them, right? And if you run around with a knife like that, then well, I'm sorry if you hurt yourself because you shouldn't, you should not handle a knife like that, and you should not you know, handle containers in a certain uh, way. So obviously, containers, Linux containers, are sharing all the same kernel. So if you can break out of that container, well, and if you happen to be root, uh, then you know, God help you, or whoever you believe in, the force. Namespaces. We're almost there. Um, namespaces, I'm assuming, Linux namespaces like process, networking, and so on might be familiar with that. Uh, almost there because uh, one part, the user namespace, is not entirely done yet. So uh, I think they are in the process, Docker, 
to at least map uh, the, the root uh, UID zero. But, uh, so this is one, one uh, topic where you could argue that it's not entirely safe, but you know, uh, getting there. And there are things you can do. You can actively, for example, lock down the networking ICC for inter-container communication, so you can uh, disallow the containers on a certain host to talk with each other. Uh, and obviously the same is, is true for storage. Uh, so things like, please, please, please do not bake your credentials in the images and then upload them on the Docker Hub. You could rather, you know, if you, if you must, then you could pass these credentials like, I don't know, your Twitter tokens or whatever uh, through environment variables. You can uh, even better put it on a shared volume, have a, a data volume container there, or if you're really a pro and you want to brag about how secure containers are, then uh, you might want to use one of these key value ideally in-memory stores such as Square's KeyWiz, HashiCorp has uh, Vault or Crypt, and they will make sure uh, that your credentials uh, are only in memory and are only there for the time being where they are needed and, and not you know, end up on, on GitHub or wherever. Now the next one is kind of like, you know, that, that's kind of the essence of that talk, right? Should I really be using a container orchestration tool? And maybe it was not yet clear what an orchestration tool does, but we get to that question. And here, my good old friend, William Data Center Shakespeare, I think it is no question that you should automate things, right? You should not be the one who gets a wake up call at 3 a.m. You go in there and SSH into that box and relaunch that app. So absolutely, yes, you should use these orchestration tools. I'm going to talk uh, about some of them in greater detail. Um, Besides these, these annoying wake-up calls, uh, there is this elasticity, so you can easily uh, scale out. You can, uh, based on the traffic, ba based on business needs and preferences, you can just add more resources there uh, without any, any manual intervention. Next one I quite often get. How do I launch, let's say, 100,000 containers? Right. So. You Google or Facebook or Twitter or what? Well, turns out that small is beautiful. And I've linked a uh, very nice talk of uh, a guy from Gute Frage in, uh, in Germany, uh, a small shop or mid-sized shop. Um, and he made the point at, at MessesCon two weeks ago that you, know, you do not necessarily have to have hundreds or thousands of nodes under management in order to benefit from these orchestration tools they literally have six nodes. And it hugely pay, pays off for them, it turns out, uh, to use, in their case, Mesos, but it's not uh, confined to Mesos. The second link I've here is containers at scale is hard, uh, which, which is an article I, I recently wrote on the platform, um, which describes or, or discusses the challenges that you have if you want to really scale, if you one day find yourself being Google or Twitter or Facebook, uh, and, and want to have or need to, to uh, manage thousands or, or more nodes. So what exactly should I use or you? Uh, I'm obviously always using Mesos, as you can imagine. Um, so for a handful of nodes, let's say five or 10 or whatever, pick whatever you like. Uh, HashiCorp, uh, like two weeks ago, announced Nomad. And if you're using Vagrant and other things, you know. These guys know how to you know, package things nicely and make it very easy for people to use. There is Kubernetes, a one-year-old um, community project, open source project, led and initiated by Google, uh, where they essentially poured their 10 odd years of experience of running containers at scale into this open source project. Uh, some people say it's a bit cumbersome to, um, to set up and maintain. If that is your worry, come to me. We have a product there that does that for you. Um, you can use Docker Swarm. It's a bit new. It's a bit like, you know, um, not totally big yet, but you can use it for a handful of nodes and you can obviously use Apache Messes. If you happen to have um, a bit more, like 100, 200 or whatever, uh, the, the selection pool, uh, you know, is a bit smaller. Kubernetes still works nicely, Messes still, and north of that, uh, pretty much currently the only open source solution you have is Apache Messes. And I'm happy to everyone 
and anyone who wants to challenge me on that to uh, engage. So I, I or you already use Chef, Puppet, Ansible, sorry, Red Hat, um, SaltStack, whatever. Do I really need a container orchestration system? <sighs> yeah, yes. So the thing is, it's really horses for courses. Obviously, when we set up a cluster, and in, uh, by that I mean like Mesosphere, uh, no matter if it's the community edition or on-prem, um, we obviously need to provision uh, the hosts, the nodes. Uh, in the community edition, for example, we use Chorus, and we, we obviously have, you know, there are things like Ansible are perfectly valid. You, you don't need to implement any very complex and, and, and complicated logic there. It's kind of fire and forget. You need to set, set up your operating system, um, in our case, the message agent, uh, and that's pretty much it. You don't uh, need anything else because all the rest, the resource abstraction, the scheduling decisions, and so on, are taken care of uh, by the container orchestration system. Um, so really, if you're talking about the application level, uh, be it you know, microservices uh, or whatever you're, you're talking there, uh, then this uh, will be taken care of, and that let, lets me, leads me to the next one, um, by this orchestration uh, framework or, or tool. So container orchestration, that's microservices, right? Well, <laughs> so I'm not going to comment on that. But there is a kernel of truth there. Um, it's, it's somehow, to a certain extent, it is an orthogonal issue. So I've seen uh, certainly a few successful ones that didn't use any you know, Docker containerized environments at all. Typically, especially if you have green grass, you know, like you, you have a clean uh, plate and, and you start from, from scratch, um, then people typically opt for, for containerized workloads. And by that, I mean they essentially say, OK, we're going to build our Docker images here. Uh, we have a CI CD pipeline here, and, and we're going to deploy that into prod. But more often than not, the, the more basic question that I tend to ask uh, prospects or, or customers is, are you actually using Git or Mercurial, if you must? Are you, uh, do you have a CI CD pipeline, something like Jenkins or Bamboo or whatever you want? Um, and actually, how do you deploy your images? Uh, and again, if it's a containerized workload, then your Docker images. And I've linked here to a, a talk a Facebook guy gave at DockerCon around their infrastructure, Tupperware, which is, uh, although they don't reveal too many low-level details, quite interesting because it spans the entire um, uh, cycle from the developer's point of view. So summarizing on, on that one, <coughs> You do not need to use containers, uh, but if you use containers for microservice, uh, implementing microservices architecture, then guess what? You will need a container orchestration system. The next one. This, is, this comes out of this you know, on-premises versus cloud versus hybrid or whatever, and it is very often only in our minds. It's, it's not so much what is possible, but what we think is possible. And that is really, there are just different things that are important. So for example, uh, if, if, if you figure out, oh, I need totally you know, scaling out, I, I need three more nodes in order to accommodate the, the traffic or, or whatever throughput. Um, so obviously, on-premises, that means something different than you, know, you click something on AWS and whoop, up comes a new, new instance there. But uh, at the end of the day, what you th should think, I believe, uh, at least for the you know, next couple of years, is you might start off with a pure on-premises solution. Uh, you might, for you know, bursting out for special seasons or a special day or whatever, um, into cloud, or even if you're in one cloud, for, for various reasons, you might f want to follow this hybrid cloud pattern, as I said, either on-premises into the cloud or between different cloud uh, vendors. So everything has its limitations. And uh, you know, one very valid um, argument or question there is, there must be some downsides to that. right? You, you, uh, it, it can't be a silver bullet. And I'm not trying to you know, sell you on that it is a silver bullet. 
Um, so the Kalashnikiti should, should symbolize that. Um, I would argue that mainly it is a social challenge rather than a technology challenge. I personally, I don't give a rat's ass if you're using Mesos or Nomad. Well, I would prefer you to use Mesos. I can give you a lot of reasons why, but I don't care as long as you use, as you don't deploy and manage your containers by hand. But there are, you know, it might be your boss, it might be your colleagues, you know, the, the guy who's already 30 years around and, and says, you know, this is really a stupid idea, you cannot do that. Uh, get them a copy of the Phoenix Project, a wonderful book. It will motivate everything uh, from this DevOps movement, or whatever you want to call it. And there are a couple of other really, really good books. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to share that. You, you won't be able to read that. Most of them are Riley, the one on the right, uh, right hand side from your point of view uh, is Manning, uh, written by a colleague of mine. Uh, but all of them essentially get you off the ground, be it Docker, uh, be it Mesos, be it Kubernetes. Uh, Nomad is, is too, uh, too young. I uh, haven't seen a, a book on Docker Swarm yet. It's partially captured by, by the Docker in production book. We've put together a community site, which is called p24e.io. Um, P24E stands for Programmable Infrastructure because this is such a long word, we've shortened it down to P24E. Uh, this is based on GitHub, so uh, pull requests are more than welcome. Um, and as this seems to be a common pattern, I expect a pull request by each and every one of you by end of day. Thank you very much. And now it's really your turn. And please, please, please think about that we really need to start worrying about what kind of world we're going to leave for Keith Richards. Over to you. What questions have you got? One there. Yes. Um, whenever you're working on like a local bot, what are some like tools I think for say you can just put up a few microservices or things in your local bot? All right, so I repeat the question. The question was, if I got that right, when you're doing local development on your laptop, what kind of environment would I use? Excellent question. I didn't pay you to ask that question. Uh, it would have been actually the next one that I was too lazy to put there. Uh, so thank you again. Um, it depends. It depends. Uh, most of them, including, yeah, all, all of them. Uh, so Nomad, Kubernetes, Mesos, and and um, and Swarm have typically based on Vagrant, so Vagrant box, uh, and depending on on your needs. So if you want to do simple stuff, then one Vagrant box, one virtual machine would do. Uh, sometimes you want to do um, you know things like split brain or whatever. Uh, where you actually need to ramp up like three or four, where well, three probably might be the, the max that you can ramp up on, on a 16 gig machine like that, uh, background boxes to simulate an actual cluster. But yeah, the, the general answer would be you will, you will find in each of these uh, orchestration or scheduler frameworks a, uh, a background box that uh, allows you to do that. Um, the other option that we also sometimes do, or very often do, we have an internal tool called uh, CCM, the cloud container, no cloud, whatever, manager. It's essentially just uh, clicking on a, on a button and it ramps up a cluster. Um, so for certain things, if you think about um, latency, if you think about how, how things work in a like 5, 10, 15 node uh, environment, you would still have the, the interface, like for example, the Kubernetes would be cube control, uh, Mesos or, or the DCOS, it would be a Quantland interface as well, or REST interface, or whatever you have. You would still have that part of the interaction on your local machine, but the rest would be in the cloud. And as I said, for certain things, you would probably need that. But most of the time, you get by uh, using these Vagrant boxes. Is that OK? Yes, please. So, uh, if you, so the next question. So the question, if I got it right, was how do I scale up a microservices architecture? No, if you look at microservices all together as an application, how do these tools help me bring up the application to scale? Oh, all right, all right. Um, so before I answer that, I, I stepping back, like just to clarify the the, um, the the terms here that we're using. When I talk about a service, I talk about something that typically has one function, one function only, a bit like you know, 
grab or something on your local box. So it has an interface, obviously, um, and it does one thing and hopefully one thing really good. When I talk about an application, it's something that typically has you know, a UI, it typically pulls or you know, engages a couple of services, and it's something end user facing, some, someone interacting with that. So if we're in agreement regarding that, then the main question is really how do you define the service layout? And one thing I didn't talk about a lot here, but there will soon be a book uh, around that topic, is service discovery, uh, which is a topic that it's, it's kind of like two sides of, of the same coin. If you are starting to use these uh, container orchestration tools, it's essentially you are not in control anymore where these containers land. And the only entity in this system that knows about that is the scheduler that decides, oh, I've got enough resources on that box, I'm going to put that container there. So the service discovery, what service discovery in this container setup really means is something that interacts with the scheduler, querying the scheduler or whatever, uh, saying like, you know, what is your current uh, state of the world? Where are all your containers running? On what IP and port are they available? There are a couple of, of these service discovery um, components and depending on, uh, you know, for example, if, you, if you're already using Zookeeper, then you can use Zookeeper for that. Uh, there are console, there is um, Eureka from, from Netflix, uh, SmartStack from Airbnb, um, there is uh, a couple of DNS-based solutions, SkyDNS, uh, MesosDNS, uh, Weaveworks, and so on and so forth. A uh, couple of, like, almost too many options, uh, but this is the critical element um, that you will need to think about before you, you know, start that, uh, that you know, planning, what kind of service discovery um, will be the basis. So there are things like um, IP assignment, uh, do you use static port assignment or dynamic port assignment, um, where is it kind of baked into the client or do you have it as a sidekick process? So a lot of, of uh, decisions, uh, and, and you probably will revise them and, and change them over time, um, that you, you need to you know, be, at least be aware of the options. So service discovery being probably one of the, the most fundamental parts because it has an implication uh, into all these, these different uh, services. The rest is pretty much dependent on, on the, the tool you're using. For example, uh, both uh, Nomad and Marathon, which is a framework on top of uh, Mesos that allows you to run um, any kinds of long-running uh, tasks uh, have the concept of applications and groups. So you can group applications and scale them up and down. Um, Kubernetes uses a slightly different approach. It's called labels. So you're labeling different objects, be that a service or whatever, and then you uh, essentially query uh, through these labels. It's a kind of flat uh, way of, of organizing things, but it's much more uh, flexible in these applications and groups. And that's pretty much everything. So if, if you decided on, on your um, service discovery and whatever the, the respective orchestration uh, tool you know, imposes or, or, or you know, allows you to do, um, that's pretty much all you need. Have you ever yeah? Used Sorry. Have you ever used Cloudify? If I have ever used Cloudify, no. All right. Any more questions? So I, I will be around today, also tomorrow. If you want to hit me up, I'm here. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>